Hello everyone, I'm Chip Greenwich. I'm good glad to have you all here. Um, today is just a community discussion about community, Juneteenth, and family. And um, we're so glad to be here in the Nubian markets, a new place that just opened up. And someone just called it the Black, the Black Whole Foods. You know, I mean, bread and circus, all this other stuff, what it is. But we're glad to get you guys over here. Um, we have so many fantastic guests today from the UNCF summer program, and first of all, I'd like for them to introduce themselves. We welcome you to our home in Boston Roxbury. So please, so right here, we have a chair right here, right over there. But we'll start. Of course, I make the, of course, I make the Morehouse man start. All right, just say who you are and um, and what your uh, your major is and where you're from. Who are you three? Yeah. Your name, your major, where you're from, and all that stuff. Um, my name is Rufus. I'm a business administration, concentration, and finance major at Morehouse College uh, from Los Angeles, California. And um, I'm working at Loomis Sales in, this summer in the marketing information department. Hi, everyone. My name is Ari. I go to George Mason University in Virginia. I'm majoring in criminology with a concentration in homeland security with a double minor in sociology and intelligence. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm working at Cambridge Associates this summer as an investment analyst. Oh, hi. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Olivia Broussard. I am a rising senior. I'm graduating in the fall. I attend Xavier University of Louisiana. I'm from the South. I'm from Baton Rouge. Um, I'm from Baton Rouge also. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a public health sciences major with a double concentration in chemistry and biology. Um, I am here and I work at a hedge fund. I work at uh, Bob, the Balpost Group and I'm a FinTech intern. So I do cybersecurity, business risk, data analysts, things like that. Okay, I'll go. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Destiny. Howard, I attend the illustrious North Carolina A&T State University, where I am a double major in marketing with a concentration in sales and supply chain management. I'm originally from Arkansas, so I'm very far from home. And this summer, I'm interning at Acadian Asset Management. So, yeah. No cameras. No cameras. Uh. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kathy. I attend George Washington University. My major is in international affairs with a minor in sociology and history. Um, I'm from Native born Washington, Washingtonian, and I'm working at State Street. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Amaya Daniels. Um, I attend Washington University in St. Louis. I'm from Columbia, Missouri, um, and I currently study a uh, double major in finance and urban studies with a minor in business and social impact. Um, and I'm currently working at Boston Trust Walden as an investment management intern, specifically focused on ESG work. Oh, hi. My name is Lucy. My name is Lucy Carpenter, and I just graduated from A&T with a degree in marketing and a minor in psychology. I am working at Westfield Capital Management as a marketing intern in the marketing and client services department. And the OGs. We're the OGs. Everyone else said all that. I'm going to start right over here. Me? Yep. Oh, I'm not an OG. Okay. No! Oh! To them they are. Hold on, hold on. Um, my name is James Levesque. I am an educator. I'm also in the finance. Um, I'm a financial service provider as well, too, um, dealing with uh, helping clients get out of debt, save their taxes, get properly insured, investments, all these different things. Um, and then also, we have a nonprofit called Talk to Them that um, teaches you know, our young adults, along with adults as well, too, financial literacy. Um, so, yeah. Please, next. My name is Richard Futrell. I am an educator and community activist. I also run a unique culinary program for students called Cooking Up a Rich Future, which teaches them financial literacy and culinary tips. That's our young OG over there. We'll put him on the spot. Do you want to say who you are? <laughs> well, your father's going to introduce you. <laughs> Next over here. Yep, we'll go with you, brother. I took the wrong corner. 
Uh, my name is Khalid Mustafa. I'm a resident of Roxbury. Uh, my name is Evan Pankey. I am a neighbor here in, in Roxbury, and uh, I work at a startup called Medically Home. I work in healthcare information technology. Um, hi, I'm Lucy Lomas, also live in Roxbury. I'm an OBGYN physician uh, focusing on women's health and wellness. Hi, my name is Cynthia Grandkaya. I am a retired teacher of 42 years in the Boston Public mm -hmm. School System. Yay. Yay. And 20 years ago, we, we chaperoned a black college tour together for two and a half weeks. Brought Boston, about 52 students from Boston down to the HBCUs. What a power, what a power. Hello, again, I'm Chip Greenwich. I'm so glad to be here with the Greatest Minds and National Black College Alliance and also with Fathers Uplift today. And um, today's just an open discussion about what does Juneteenth mean to us, or what does our community look and need as we go forward, but also just a, just a time just to get people together on this day. Um, even though it's known as a holiday, but I think it's a good day just to bring people together and share thoughts and so forth. Um, so um, I'd like to open it up um, and just, um, just say who I am um, personally, is that I'm really glad to be here. I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts um, for my whole life, um, went to Morehouse College, and um, learned so much at, the, uh, at Morehouse College. I think the first thing is that someone growing up in a multicultural <coughs> environment like Cambridge, Massachusetts, I went down there and I said, oh my God, I've never seen so many black people in my life. <laughs> and I think I was frightened the first week because it was very interesting that you know, you had, um, you had black people with um, extreme wealth or a lot of wealth and, you know, we're just kind of working class where I grew up. And then, you know, it was just very interesting being in that kind of context. But the, thing, the best thing about it was um, seeing um, black people, young, especially black men, be able to be who they wanted to be. I had a football captain by the name of Jimmy Davis. He was two years older than me. He was a biochem major. He was uh, 4.0. Uh, and also he played the violin or something like that or something like this. So those are things that really interest me. People were very interested in being their own skin. Um, after I did my years at Morehouse, I decided to come back and um, work in the city of Boston in philanthropy, education, and so forth. Um, I was able to uh, run my own nonprofit uh, called the National Black College Alliance, where I met Arthur. Uh, He's a couple years younger than me. But one thing we did is that when we were, when we were in high school, when we came back from the college students, um, we came back to the local high schools and did recruiting for the HBCUs in the 90s and so forth. So we were able to build a kind of large HBCU mo movement here in the city. Um, the best thing was um, when Art would get into school, all his friends and boys said, wait a minute, how'd you get into school and what school? And then they applied and they got to school. And so we kind of had this multiple effect here in the Boston area of lots of young um, African-American brothers and sisters going to college. And Rich, even though he was smart, he got a full scholarship to Babson but he's still part of the HBCU network as well over there. Um, so it brings me to today. Um, I started a group called Greatest Minds, a part of um, the National Black College Alliance years ago, but it's about bringing community together, generations together, just to talk about where people are today, how they feel, but also talking about everyone's own journey. This brother has his own journey, which I'm so proud, as my mega brother has done great work. And I remember seeing his stuff out in the community, because I just got back, and I said, Father's Uplift, Father's Uplift, and then I go to a, a mega brother, that, that he's right there with his van and everything, and I was so proud. And so when I thought about today, I knew to include him somehow, especially um, with the great work that he's doing in Dorchester and so forth. And also, my man right here, Arthur, who's collaborated with me for many things since the 1990s. Um, we were at his house last week, and I was thinking about putting this event together, and then he passed me his book, and I said, Art, you did a book again, you know? So um, what he's decided to do today is that he's going to gift all you guys. How many books you have here today? I got 15 of them. All right, all right. 15 books. He's going to gift you one of his books that he just um, passed, gave out. But I thought it would be a really good thing for us to share um, some of those thoughts and memories. And also, I hope that today he'll share two or three of those readings, right? Yeah, yeah sure. All right, I'll put our author on the spot and so forth. So um, that's, what, that's the agenda today. We shouldn't be that long. We got food coming in 20 minutes. So it's just kind of just a casual conversation. So um, I think Art, you should start and we'll close out with him. Just, um, just, you know, just in general. What, how about this? What inspired you to write this book today? Ooh, that's a good question. So I, um, I went to school in Atlanta. I went to Clark Atlanta University. And um, 
we were part of a scholarship group. That, uh, we were part of a scholarship program called Project Reach, which was Road to Education and Achievement. And the goal of Reach was to help us go to college, but come back and do work in our communities. And so one of the things that happened is that many of us went to places like D.C., we went to places like Atlanta, and most of us never came back to Boston. And I think we're feeling the effects of that. One of the, the um, things I wrote about in my master's program was the migration of black leadership in Boston. And, I, and it, it contributes to, I think, of what, what happens to the gentrification that has come in heavy and strong in the last 10 years here. Well, what stopped, what, why, why I wrote the book, because I'm 20 years in the Boston public schools as well, as I'm going into my 21st year and my focus is around restorative justice. And one of the things that I've, I've noticed is that, um, in particular, I want to see more of our boys reading. You know, I always tell people that I've been able to travel to other planets, I've fought in wars, I've fallen in love, and I've done, I've done all those things through reading because I was able to do going on a, on, a, on a huge journey. And if you're not familiar, I'm going to tell you one name, Octavia Butler. If you've never read anything about Octavia Butler, go and read something by Octavia Butler. Black woman from Compton, and I think she's the best sci-fi writer ever. But um, I wanted to be able to contribute something back to the world, and that's what um, started me um, on this. Actually, it's my first book. I've had things published, but this is actually my first time um, publishing my, my own work. Also, Arthur, let's be clear, uh, you have many talents. Uh, You've also came out with a couple of uh, rap albums. Let's be real. Yeah. Come on, yeah. oh, I'm good. All right. That's what I do. Oh. That's what I do. That's what I do. <laughs> that was a long time ago. So I've also been a member of um, the Lizard Lounge Slam team, um, multiple teams, more than I can count at the time. We actually had our first regional after after COVID. Um, definitely come down. You said it's COVID. Lizard Lounge. Lizard Lounge. It's a good place to come eat and meet people. And, and share your work if you write. Okay. And just for your journey about, you know, going someone that went to Boston, or John D. O'Brien, right? Or yeah, Boston Tech. Well, it was Boston Tech at the time. Yeah, talk about your journey going to college and what was your trajectory, um, being someone from Dorchester and all that. So I had um, my mother and my father, neither neither went to college. My father went to work for Gillette, right, um, right at the age of 18 as an apprentice, and he worked as a machinist until he retired at 50. My mother struggled in made everything right for me and my sister. So I had an older sister um, who went to college. And then I have, a, I, have a, uh, I have another sister on my father's side. Both of them are older than me. Both of them went to college. Um, and the expectation was that I was going to go to college. So it wasn't like an option. I couldn't not go. And so um, that's kind of like what really pushed me to, to, to go see something else, get out of Boston. I didn't think at the time you could get any blacker in Boston because I never left Roxbury, Dorchester, or Mattapan. It's very different now. You know, it's very different now, but you got to think of the folks who came out of this, out of Roxbury in particular. You have Farrakhan, you have Malcolm X who lives around here, and it was so much progressive stuff, at least what I saw. Um, also Bobby Brown. All of you <laughs> and then, we, I practiced martial arts growing up, and all my instructors were Black Panthers. And one, and actually his aunt was, was his, uh, his, his, he has a cousin who's one of my best friends, and it was his mother who was part of the Panther movement that actually got us all into it and trained by all these, these men. So we had a, a, a huge support network growing up here. And um, it's kind of why I came back and, and wanted to be able to contribute the same thing that folks had done for me. You know, because I think we, we miss some of that now. Now, yourself, you're proud what, Bethune, what? The great Bethune Cookman. Let, let them know about Bethune Cookman here. Do everyone know about Bethune yeah, Cookman here? Of course. Yes, man, we're proud of Bethune. All right, give us the yeah. history, man. I made she, sure. Um, Founded the school with a dollar and fifty cent on the yeah, trash mound yeah. back in the day. Yeah, and she said she would not rest until all of her boys and girls had an opportunity to a decent education. So you know, some schools place high value on the SAT and ACT that wasn't a requirement for Bethune Cook University. And that's the only way I got to the school. You know, I got the I had an SAT score of two hundred. I got the points. Hey, what up? Is that what you just signed your name? You signed your name. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. That was me. The ACT score was very low. But since then, I went on and got my doctorate. I got another master's and um, started an organization that works with fathers. Um, the first in the country is a mental health and substance use treatment facility for fathers and their families. Did a TED talk that has reached over 2 million people. I mean, there's a lot. Became President Obama's fellow, met him and spent time with Mrs. Mrs. Obama often. So when you look at that from Bethune Cook University to now, I mean, second chances matter, right? You know? I'm a product of that second chance. Mm. Yeah. Talk about your family, man. I, I, I yeah, did a little yeah. research on you, man. 
Talk about yeah, it, man. Yeah, yeah. You're so, from where? Where you from? So born in Atlanta. Right. I'm at Piedmont Hospital. Um, raised in Riverdale, Georgia, right next door to College Park, where the Hartsville Airport is. Right, and I applied to Morehouse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't get into Morehouse. All right. Mm -hmm. right, but uh, my pastor went to Morehouse. Matter of fact, he went to school with um, Pastor Edward Lumpkin, went to school yeah. with Dr. Martin Luther King mm -hmm. in Morehouse. Right, so I was raised in church in that area where we would go to the Ebenezer Baptist Church, and we would actually have Sunday school in the first Ebenezer Baptist That's Church right. in the basement, you know, before it became a museum. I don't know, can people still go in there? Yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. But now, you know, when I look at that journey and just growing up near him, near other people, you know, having the fried chicken dinners and, you know, um, seeing the first um, mayor of Atlanta and meeting those people, man, it was crazy, you know. That was my experience as a child. So when I came to Boston, you know, I, I, I knew who I was because I went to Bethune-Cookman, but I also was around people in Atlanta that really accomplished some great things. So I knew I could come here and do anything if I put my mind to it, you know. But I also understood that racism was different in Boston as opposed to Atlanta, right? In Atlanta, they'll call you the N-word to your face, right? Up here, it's very, um, you know, behind the scenes, discreet. You know, if you say racism exists, they'll look at you like you're crazy. Mm -hmm. So I had to adjust from having it outward in your face to not necessarily seeing it, but feeling it. Mm -hmm. Microaggressions is what we call it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's been my experience. My mom grew up in a household. She was a um, single woman, single black woman. Um, had a full-time job working right before she was retired, retired, right? She ended up being diagnosed with epilepsy and ended up losing over $250,000 in the stock market crash. So my life went from middle class to poor in a second. And, um, and I never realized why she was saving we were poor. She said, you know, you're going to go to college. You're going to get your education. I said, Ma, how? We're poor. And she said, God got it. So I ended up going. And um, her old boyfriend, I just found out, um, Uncle Larry, I used to call him Uncle Larry my entire life, co-signed for me to get a loan to go to Bethune Cookman. Oh, wow. And that's the only reason why um, I actually ended up, ended up there, because he co-signed for me. And I asked him why he co-signed for me recently, because I paid the loan back in full. And he said, I always believed in you, looked at you, looked at you as, as if you were my child. So um, that was Uncle Larry. Thank God for mom's boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> right? It worked out. He goes out for the law and I end up getting a degree. And I've been able to pay him back. But um, high school graduate, my mom was. My father was also a high school graduate. He wasn't in my life. He definitely inspiration behind why Father's Up that was created. But um, my mom, when she was getting ready to walk across, well, she couldn't walk across the stage because she was pregnant with my oldest brother. She had him at 16 years old. So I never, I never realized why she wanted to go to college so bad. I guess because she couldn't walk across the stage. So since now I had an opportunity to walk across the stages that she didn't have a chance to walk across. I walked across three so far. And, uh, and I never even understood why it was so important to her, but now I did. She told me recently why going to college was so important to her. But that's me for a long shot. You know, since our inception of Fathers Up, we've served over 12,000 fathers and families, helped them reconnect to their fathers, I mean, reconnected to their families. And I uh, have a staff of over 30 people, it's growing get ready to open an office in Baltimore and Atlanta. And that's me, a little oh. shot, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now some of you young people here, we're gonna put you on the spot, all right? Oh. <laughs> What's your story? This is Juneteenth, this is about celebrating I stories. I hope Rufus first. Rufus Who was it? Yeah, he has he a story. Like that, but, uh, <laughs> I don't really have a crazy story. Uh, Let's see, um, my mom's from Lagos, Nigeria, uh, moved, moved to LA when she was around seven years old. Um, she grew up there, uh, she met my dad, my dad was, he's from Alabama, so he's a, his country as well. Uh, his country as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I moved around a lot. First, I was living in, uh, uh, was it Alabama, I was born in Alabama moved to Mississippi, and then moved to LA one final time. Uh, my dad, yeah, he kind of wasn't there crazy, but um, I think I've, I've seen my dad for the first time in 12 years, like last semester. Uh, let's see, grew up in a household full of women. I got four sisters and one brother. Uh, first generation college student. Uh, let's see. I, I, I always wanted to go to Morehouse because of my seventh grade uh, science teacher. Uh, I knew nothing about Morehouse or HBCUs or college in general, but then I joined a, um, a mentorship program. 
And then when I joined that mentorship program, I, I kind of went in rooms that I usually wouldn't have went in if I was just Talk in the streets it. of Los Angeles. Uh, a lot of my friends didn't like go to college, uh, but I'm, I'm kind of happy I did. I met a whole bunch of new types of people. I've seen a whole bunch of new places. Uh, I met people like this in this room. You got a whole bunch of philanthropy. Uh, you got businessmen, you got businesswomen. Um, and I kinda, I'm glad, I'm glad I went to Morehouse because I get to see a whole range of black people. You know, you got black people that grew up in poor households, right. middle class, you got people who are just wealthy. You got um, people who grew up around a whole bunch of white people, people who've just never been around black people. So it's just, it's just, a, it's just the whole dynamic of uh, being around people that look like you and not scared to be yourself. That's right. You know, I, I, spent, uh, I spent a lot of years of my childhood just scared to just be myself, uh, afraid of what others would look at, look at me as. So, um, yeah, I got to Morehouse, uh, joined the track team. I wanted to play football, but it's a whole bunch of politics in football. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, been on the track team there, I met Willie Hill. I'm not sure if he was there when you were there, but he's, he's a tough dude. Uh, I, joined a whole, I, joined, <laughs> I joined a whole bunch of UNCF programs, trying because I, I promised my mom she wouldn't pay for my college. Like I didn't, my mom knows, knows nothing about college. Uh, I'm probably the one that's uh, just out here learning for myself. And I, I take that knowledge I get and I bring it back home. I'm so enthusiastic about being in these rooms because mm. why wouldn't you take the opportunity when, when it's right there? So, um, so I've, been in, I've been in Boston for a couple weeks now and I've been learning so much. And uh, I call my siblings and my mom and I'd be like, Mom, I learned about this, I did this. And um, especially when it comes to like, you know, finances, that, that was nothing we uh, talked about in my household. Uh, you know, you either got it or you don't got it. So, Hello. Uh, I've been I've been trying my hardest to learn as much as I can. I've been a sponge in these big places. I'm I'm, I'm the type of dude that talks. I talk so much. I'm sure you guys you know, mm. seen. I talk so much because I'm so I'm so enthusiastic about uh, of what I'm saying or what I'm doing because I want to be that person you're gonna remember. So. Uh, yeah, man, I'm taking a, and you said you did a, you're doing a financial literacy, you do financial literacy. That's crazy, because I was in uh, D.C. in the past, like, uh, when we first got here, we was in D.C., so I've been trying to reach out to, like, to other people so I could start my own financial literacy class at, like, middle schools in Atlanta, so I've been trying to do that as well. I've been trying to spread the knowledge, spread the wealth, so I've been, um, Doing that, um, he's trying to expand to Atlanta. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been, that's what I've been doing. I've been trying to network crazy, uh, especially at my job. Um, I think I've been to a couple of sessions where they've like, go speak to the CEO and do this. I've been trying my hardest to do that. So, uh, yeah, man, I've been enjoying my time in Boston. I've been enjoying this whole experience, meeting new people. So yeah, that's a little bit about myself. I can't get a whole spill, but that's me. <laughs> Well, I always joke that Rufus. Yeah. Um, I always joke that Rufus is a reincarnation of my dad because my dad was supposed to run track at Morehouse, but both my parents they were born and raised in LA and stayed there because they have me and my twin sister, who also just graduated from Hampton. So they said, "Well, we got to get jobs and just go to school here." They both graduated from college in five years with a gap year. So I've ne I've never been a first generation college kid. My great grandfather has a PhD from UCLA, so I've always had that ambition to go towards. But I said, "You know what?" We're gonna go to we're gonna go to an HBCU. I'm very Aggie pride all the time, yeah. <laughs> and I think also having my sister at another HBCU. I always joke that I was the first one to graduate from HBCU because she graduated May 13th. I graduated graduated May 14th. <laughs> but part of um, we moved to San Antonio, Texas when I was about six. So I grew up as a little black girl in a mainly Hispanic white area. So it does a lot to your self-confidence, your self-worth, how you think, and especially not being valued by the black boys you're around. Because they, they were boys back then, now they're men. But definitely getting out of that environment taught me how to be more confident and not so much be, and not in a bad way, but be more of like a, let me do things. I work for Victoria's Secret Pink, and that's typically like, uh, you know, you think of white girls, Lululemon, wearing that type of brand, but I work for them. And so trying to be that black girl without saying like, do, doing stuff like this, wearing claw clips and clothes like this, and buying base bags and not attributing it only to whiteness, but just to, luxury and doing things like that and earning nice things for yourself and trying to also as Rufus said talking to the CEO but also giving back so I mainly went to HBCU I was in a youth sorority under Phi Delta Kappa which is a black educator sorority in my town 
And so I went there and all the seniors walk across the stage and say, like, I'm going to this school, I'm going to that school. They're all saying Prairie View and a and and Howard. And I'm like, well, like, what's the T? Like, well, I'm, I'm talking about UCLA and schools in California trying to go back to LA, but like, what's the T? Looked it up, originally supposed to go to Prairie View. It's in the middle of nowhere. So I wasn't gonna do that. a <laughs> and just was a medium-sized university with a good psychology program. And I said, well, I'm gonna go there. Had no scholarships at all. I maybe had a couple, I think, like $6,000. I was an out-of-state student, so way more expensive. And I told my parents, I said, I got it. Like, a little, little bit of delusion, you know, like manifest, like, I, I like school would be paid for. And it ended being paid for, I applied for scholarships, and they put more into students while they're in school because typically freshmen, their rate of retention is really, really low. And so I banked on that and said, well, I'm gonna get them where everyone else is, you know, kind of not finishing out their degree. And it worked out. Me and my sister both graduated college almost debt-free. Our parents have to pay very, very little. And I'm not gonna go to school again. I'm going to share the wealth I learned in school and give back and you know kill it in the marketing world and be in these spaces where black creatives should be. Yeah, so um, my mom was born and raised in Boonville, Missouri. So it's like a very small city, very much like homegrown, but then um, when she was six, when she was 19, she decided to move to Columbia, Missouri, which is like our big city. Um, and basically, um, she met my dad. Didn't really work out, but she had me. Um, and then right around when I was two, my dad got sent to prison. Um, and then basically, he's just been in and out of jail for a very long time. Um, so we just don't have that good relationship anymore. But my mom, ever since she's six, been 16, she has been disabled. So I'm a parent, I'm a child of a, well, I'm an able-bodied body child of a disabled parent. And so kind of like having to do that caretaking role ever since I was a kid. Um, but my mom has like never been the type to like sugarcoat anything. So like she's been, since she can only work part time, she has always been kind of like been warped into the payday loans and like the different side of that and so I've always like had to be like wait why don't we have enough money for this and she'd be like oh well it's because I had to take a loan for this and stuff of that nature so it kind of grew me to think a lot about finances and think about like why it was important to be a part of education and things of that nature because my mom when I was growing up she really wanted to get her degree so she started in community college and then um, she basically, I'm just watching her the whole time, like her writing these essays, and then now she has her master's, and she's just like, she's always just like busy, busy, busy with that, and I'm like, whoa, like why? And then whenever I got to middle school, I always thought like, oh, well, I just need to get good grades, and like I can go to college, and like, I'll get a job, and then boom, that's it. But the reality is really not like that. And so I kind of learned like, oh, I really need to like make these connections with people, and like really learn more about not only like the people in my school, but also like my community. And so I really started to think about like, oh, joining clubs and like learning how like how I can be involved within my own city. Um, and then I got nominated for like a summer program and I was like, oh, I don't really know if I want to do this. Um, and it has led me to getting a full ride at WashU um, because I told my mom just like Rufus, I didn't want my mom to pay for college and I was going to make that happen no matter what. And so. It's been a very nice experience. And although I don't go to HBCU, um, I still try to have that same experience on campus. Last year I lived in an all black student housing called Hamsini, which is, stands for 50 in Swahili. Um, since there's a Brooking Occupations at WashU where basically kind of the same thing to the civil rights movement, asking for more space for students on campus. So it's been a really nice opportunity for me. And um, I'm also very interested in financial literacy as well. Like I have the biggest career goal of being a financial advisor for low income families. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit of it. Bring it Yeah, okay. Well, hi everyone. Um, so, a little background about me. I'm from Virginia, so a little far from home, but not too far. Um, born and raised. I come from, well, my parents are, they, my mom is Haitian. And my dad is from Georgia, born in Alabama. Um, and he's a little older, so he'll tell me about like his time in the South when he was a kid. And it was always so interesting and educational to hear about just like what it was like right after the Civil Rights Movement and 
what black people had to go through and then uh, my mom being Haitian she would teach me about the Caribbean culture and things like that but I come from a low income family um, sometimes fell below the poverty line sometimes didn't um, and I'm the youngest so I'm the baby um, and all of my siblings are all grown now uh, and they're doing their own things and so like Rufus I've been in contact with my family updating them about like what's going on what I'm doing what Boston's like um, everyone thinks Boston's super racist, so they're like telling me to like, be careful, watch out. Um, but um, growing up, I grew up majority in like a predominantly white area with upper middle class, middle class folks. Um, and so I never was like, never really saw myself a lot in the room. And then um, I wasn't. I guess I was a late bloomer. I didn't learn how to read until I was almost eight, and everyone thought I had some kind of intellectual disability, um, but my parents refused to give up on me, and then uh, it eventually moved to me being put into advanced classes, um, and then I really wasn't in the room anymore. It was mostly the white people, um, and couldn't really relate, couldn't see myself. And then when it came time for high school and graduation, um, I didn't go to an HBCU. I did get into a couple, Howard, um, who else? Spellman. But I didn't want to go too far from home because I also had to pay for my education completely by myself. Um, and so that comes with like the scholarships and grants and loans. I had to educate myself financially because similar to everyone else, there was no financial literacy in my household. My parents actually told me to take out loans because they thought that was what everyone else did. Um, and so it was, it was a very difficult time trying to navigate how to go to school um, when you obviously just don't have the money to do so. Um, I applied, I got into 21 different schools um, and had to narrow it down. I narrowed it down to a public university right outside DC. And I took a loan, I took a small loan out, and I was just like, I had no plans for how I was going to even pay for the second semester. Do not be like me. <laughs> but I was just like, I got it. I was just like, I got this. Like, I just need a couple of months and I got it together. And surprise, surprise, uh, that's actually exactly what happened. UNCF swooped in. I got my first scholarship and they paid for my second semester. And then ever since then, I've been able to pay school all by myself with grants and scholarships. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I'm here now because of UNCF and in this program and doing so much because I really want to keep it moving and spread the wealth of knowledge I've learned with everyone else. Um, we talked about being and teaching people about personal finance and I actually just got, I'm starting my training to be um, a personal finance mentor with high school and middle school students um, in my local area near my school and it's really just something I believe a lot in because I just don't, I didn't have it and I could have went down a very different path and been in a very different place. So I'm trying to do my best and be my best and spread what I know. Now, this is what you call emancipation and this is what you call Juneteenth, what you guys are doing here today. And I thank you for it. Um, I want to close out with one question and have people go around and I'm have Arthur do two, two poems out of his book. Are you ready, Arthur? Yeah. Right, you want to do? You want to do something off the head, or you want to do something off the book? Oh, I don't like to read. I don't like to read my own stuff. <laughs> all right, all right, good, good. So I want you guys to think back. I want you to think about your grandmother, your grandfather, or your great grandmother, grandfather, grandfather, and go back and think what they were doing a hundred years ago. My, I was about to go my great grandfather a hundred years ago, and share if you know. If you don't, grandfather's fine. If you know, mother's fine, and so forth. Um, I want to tell you that. Um, for me, my great-grandfather, his name was George Reginald Markinson. He came from um, St. Kitts here in the, I think, 1900s. And um, he was an author and a writer. And um, he was um, uh, biracial. Um, he had a very rich uh, father. Um, so he was able to go to all the great schools and um, St. Kitts and so forth. But he was an author. And um, 
when he um, he came here, he decided to put out his own books, and he has um, his own books out. Um, so when Arthur put out his own books, I was very proud to think about my uh, my uh, great grandfather, um, whom I'm I'm also named up both sides of the name for George. And my other family member is um, Reverend James Greenwich, who on Cedar Street started uh, St. James um, in Roxbury, St. James uh, AME Church. You guys know St. James over there in Roxbury. He was the founder of that church, and he came over here in the 1800s from Barbados. And um, him and his family uh, started that church over there. It's, uh, right now, I think it's going for condos or something like that. But um, it was an um, AME church, and he was very proud Garveyite. My family was very proud Garveyite um, about black empowerment and so forth. So I want you guys to bring those people into the room. Um, do you want to go? Everybody? Grandfather, great grandparents? Oh, wow. Well, grandmother. I can do grandma. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some people can't go, you know. Yeah. Grandma. I had to do a swab to go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. My grandmother was a house, housekeeper in West Palm Beach, Georgia. The rumor in her family is that she cleaned the houses of the president of the Kennedys when they, in their summer homes in West Palm Beach, Florida. But yeah. You can share one or two, whatever you want to share about the grandma. Yeah. Anybody else? Next no, best stick with that. Anyone can just jump right in if you want to just go for it. Go for it. Okay, so I'm Creole, French Creole. So on my mom's side, my great grandparents were white passing. So a lot of different history there. Um, or however you would say, we say white passing. I mean, um, it's a very complicated history. On some ways, um, they didn't play into that, although they were. Um, they definitely made sure that the spaces that they were in, people knew that they were African American, although they didn't look like it. Um, it opened a lot of different doors in different ways. Some of them were able to go to school, some of them weren't. I have family who went to California and never came back and, you know, lived in that truth. You know, some decided not to. On the other side of that, um, I have Creole grandparents who were slaves and then who were sharecroppers and so who owned their own land, French speaking, no English at all, um, who lived in Lafayette, uh, lived on camps, had horses and things like that. So uh, two different sides of community definitely. Um, a lot of history and a lot of culture in that um, French Creole space and area that contributed to me in a lot of different ways, but I would say that's about as far back. You don't have to share, but anyone want to share? I'll go. So my great grandma, um, she was born in 1933. She was born and raised in Arkansas. So she raised me till I was time to go to kindergarten. I remember like my mom was like, I knew it was time for you to go to pre-K because somebody would ask me how old I was and I'd be like, if the good Lord see fit, I'd be 10 by this day. So that's how they knew like, okay, my great grandma is teaching me way too much. Um, but growing up as a kid, um, since she was born in 1933, like when I would go to elementary school, I would come back and teach her how to read or write some words that she didn't know how to. And then she would tell me back in the day, like in order for them to go to the grocery store, they would have to walk like three miles down the street, catch a boat, get here. And so before she passed away from cancer, when I was like eight or nine, she was like, I want you to get in rooms that I got kicked out of. And so I just keep that in my head, like, Stay get in rooms that she got kicked out of and stay there. So. Anybody else you don't have to share? Uh, I, I would like to share. I want to honor my uh, great grandmother who was born in 1900 and my grandmother was born in uh, 1917. Um, my grandmother was a domestic, my great grandmother was a domestic. She came up to Washington, D.C. and she left her daughter down in Charlotte Courthouse, Virginia. Uh, her parents passed, and she had to, my grandmother was sent up to Virginia. She was, my great grandma was cleaning the house of this family called the Whites, and they uh, they said you can't keep your daughter here. My grandmother didn't know what to, my great grandmother didn't know what to do. She went to a black dentist, and uh, that black dentist said, uh, "I will basically adopt your daughter, and she can come here anytime she wants." And that's how my uh, grandmother was was raised. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, she became an entrepreneur. She was uh, uh, in the culinary art. She was always catering, and she she always had her own money and, and helped took care of my mother and, and others. So I'm just grateful for for their story, both of their both of them and their their struggles. Thank you. Call 
colleague. Um, I, just, I, I don't know my dad. Um, he was oldest of 27 children. He lived through some out. He was from some Alabama. Um, he went through that whole amendments thing and um, 13 amendments. How many kids? How many kids again? 27. Say, how many? What you say? 27. Yeah, yeah. Um, he came out here. He was working for the Department of Defense. Um, he got jumped when they're doing all that whole busing thing. Um, he's always pushed us to education, you know, private school, all that stuff. I chose a different life. <laughs> I, I got into some trouble when I was younger. Put me in places that I didn't want to be in. Embarrassed my family. Um, so went back to school. Didn't finish, but I was. But I worked all over the world. I traveled. All over the world, I've been everywhere. Um, but yeah, my dad, I give him much utmost because he was um, he was the he was the whole yard down for our family. Yeah, I'm sorry. Anybody else? Sure. One more. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, this story reminded a little bit about similar to mine. Um, my dad and my grandmother. Um, his was it your grandmother had 27 kids? It's a dad. His, yeah. My, my dad is the second youngest of 18, um, and my grandmother birthed and raised all of them on a sharecropping farm. And so my dad would tell me the story about how when the youngest came, his mom gave birth, packed him up, and then went back to the field like the, the day later. Um, and so she always raised them. They never had doctors because she would just, she was like, she would just go into the forest, pull some roots, make something, have them drink it, and they'd be okay in a couple days. So like she was the doctor, the teacher, the, the homemaker, taught them everything that they knew. And then she also was able to send them all up to Philly to get them out of that life. Um, but I feel like she was just like such a strong woman and to be able to do all of that with all of those kids, I could not imagine. <laughs> I could not imagine. Um, and um, I think it was, I don't know, I, before we came here, we had a, a convention where we went and they brought so many interesting and amazing black entrepreneurs and individuals to come and talk to us. And there's something that just like stuck in my head where one of them is just like you carry all of the people before you with you into your spaces, right into on. your room. And so you just have to remember like they did all of that so you can be where you are now. And so that's something I try to remember. Beautiful. Thank you. We also have uh, OBGYN doctor right here in the room. And I, mean, I just met her maybe like a week ago, and we were just sitting here talking, and just for her to hear about 18 women having 18 children and 24 women children, and also going into roots and doing that. Um, she's also about to start her own blog, right? Why don't you just say who you are? I'm gonna put you on the spot as I always do. <laughs> okay, I may have said this once, but um, I'm Lucy Lomas. Um, as Chip mentioned, I'm an OBGYN physician, and you know, one of the things that I just want people to understand more of is wellness and really recognize what that looks like for you, everyone as an individual. Um, for your grandmother, that was your grandmother? Yeah. For your grandmother, right? You know, that story weighs very heavily on me because when did she rest? She never had that opportunity. So that is our job and responsibility, to prioritize our own health and well-being, show up the best version of yourself, so you can show up better for your family, for your neighbors, for your community. Anything about the blog coming out? I know I pushed you on this, but go ahead. Um, so you can follow me on Instagram, Dr. Lucy Lomas. Um, I am moving towards building a wellness center. Right, this truly collaborative place for doctors and midwives and doulas and people to learn about their mental health and well-being, wellness practitioners. Um, you know, we need to learn some fundamental tools, right? We're talking a lot about wealth empowerment. What about health empowerment? There's so much that each of us can do individually for ourselves. Um, alongside your doctors and surgeons and everyone else. So.
Walter gives up, uh, all, Arthur gives up there is, um, what is the most, what is the most misconception that you're, from your work with Fathers of Love that you're hearing that people think about black fathers or fathers that you're working with? You know, yeah. that are going through substance abuse and all those other things. What's the most common thing that people think about when they think about black fathers? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. 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 I don't went on my page and wrote that um, to state that black fathers are absent is a lie, right? So for us, we've always been, we got to tell both sides of the coin, right? We got black fathers like myself that are present every day. We got black fathers that are fighting like hell to stay in their kids' lives. Incarceration is keeping them away. Sickness, shame, guilt, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, right? A whole host of challenges, and I feel like, you know, one thing that I don't do, I don't put things in the closet because we don't address it if it's in the closet, right? You gotta, you gotta air the dirty laundry. I believe that both stories can be told. So the misconception is yes, we are dealing with a, an absenteeism issue in our community, but also at the same time, there are great fathers out there and I believe that both stories can be told. But a lot of people don't believe that, but that's fine, right? But we'll tell, we're, we're gonna continue to tell both stories. That's my wife, yeah, so. Who's that with you right there in the arm? Any sorrow roars in here? No? They're too busy double, triple master, um, double, triple mastering. Arthur, thank you guys for being here. Arthur, can you close this all out with two pieces, please? I will. <clears throat> but first, I want to say, I heard a lot of stories here today, and the work that I do is centered about uh, around restorative justice, and that work is all about people telling their stories. As you listen to folks that were here today, there's so so many connections and from people all over the world. My daughter was Miss George Mason um, for 2016. My family's from Alabama. I mean, I just heard so many different connections, and, and my other side of the family's from Virginia too. So um, I'm gonna tell y'all a couple stories, all right? And here's one. You'll appreciate this more as you get older. <laughs> the older black men get, the less the world cares about us. It stares at us through judgmental dry eyes. FYI, men do cry when we're alone because we too get lonely. But no one cries when we die except our mothers, lovers, and dead homies. I'm the only good son to my mom and my pop. Our murders and suicides are increasing. I am no longer afraid of death, but I am definitely afraid of being shot being forcefully stopped by cops and dehumanized. No right of safe passage. And even though we code switch, we wear the mask. My younger counterparts wear their pants sagging as if to say, you can kiss my ass. And I'm not mad at that because it is now as it always was. What I want for myself, I want for my bruds. Visualize this love because we are the invisible men that Ralph Ellison spoke of. Extinct on the brink of a human being forgotten, rotting away inside the strict pipelines of public schools and private cells, rotting away inside our self, esteem. It seems that people who want the most tolerance have the least tolerance. Did you witness the outright murder of Philando Castile? Woman by his side, baby in the back seat when he was killed? They say be vulnerable, but vulnerability gets us killed. I should warn you that I am armed with intelligence. 50 years of qualitative research, data collections, documented evidence. I wanted to be, the results to be more joyful and happy. I was once eager and scrappy, but even the mightiest of warriors get tired of fighting, tired of trying to enlighten and at the same time be enlightened. We are the sons of light, Allah's reflection, a solar kufakiri, caught inside the blind sights of the world's animosity. Yen does not exist without yang. Even ancient philosophers knew that the world evolved through reciprocity. There is dark, there is bright, there is fire, there is water. I am a paradox speaking candidly and honestly because honesty is a characteristic that has become mystical. One day the guilt will consume the very same poetry venues that were meant to bind us, remind us that our words become legacies and should remain timeless. But death is where you find us, amongst our fallen brethren. But we don't die. We simply ascend to the higher heights of heaven. From boys to men to deity, refusing to be forgotten. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
short one, I know I'm going to stand up. I ain't got no short ones, man. They're all long. Uh, 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 you asked me. You asked me. That was yeah, yeah, it. was a slam poetry one or what? That's the shortest one. I'm not even coming in and I feel bad. Yeah. 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 I'm going to give you one more, but it ain't short that you're going to appreciate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I too am a father and I have three daughters and I got one daughter who is very special. I'm going to tell you a story about it. Dr. John Langdon Dow was the first to identify it. He categorized it as a syndrome, a condition of special edition children with an extra pair of chromosomes. One out of 800 births is the ratio crossing all groups, economic and racial. Now prenatal, these kids were labeled mongoloids, retards, downies. So if you know what's good for you, don't ever say those words around. At first, there was denial because her mother informed me that she would be a very special child with a flat facial profile, slanting eyes. I was surprised my daughter Taylor has the grayest eyes that mesmerize. Light brown hair, skin is orange as the sun. And even with her protruding tongue, she is my hero unsung. Now we overcame hearing loss by signing. I overcame hearing loss by listening. At school, we designed an individual educational plan, and at home before Obama, we knew that, yes, yes, she can. There's potential congenital heart disease and vision disorders. As parents, we discovered ways to conquer the physical and developmental delays. Little Miss Taylor Ray, she saw a long list of speech, physical, and occupational therapists. At times, these challenges seem too high to climb, so tell me, how does one stand to behold the sublime? There were surgeries, emergency medical procedures, seizures. We never considered abortion. Her existence is a blessing. I am her King Arthur. She is my tiny princess of perfection, my little homies. And for those of you who don't know me, my youngest daughter Taylor was born with an extra 21st trisomy, a chromosomal structure that makes her unique. So watch her actions if you can't understand her speech. She repeats, she repeats, she imitates, and we laugh back at you. And when daddy is sad, our favorite saying is, give me some kisses. And it changes my whole attitude. Her smile makes my life worthwhile. The public is corrupted with misinformation because kids with Down syndrome can always exceed other people's lowered expectations. I take life in moderation, but I'm thankful to raise another of God's greatest creations. I had to learn patience, lovingly address ignorant statements, but I recognize this vibe of pride I feel inside, this unconditional love. And it changed me from the man that I once was. On the buddy walk, Taylor was my buddy, my apprentice, my sweet petite athlete who competes in the Special Olympics. No poetry slams and poetry jams, that's big biz today, but don't none of that compare to Down Syndrome kids. Are you down? I am. Listen. <laughs> You want to talk to him before we move in the market? That's not right. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no. Welcome, everybody. Sorry I was late. I was in the meeting, but I was, you know, listening. And to actually ended on that note was just unbelievable. And I'm grateful to be able to um, have this gathering, you know, in this space. Um, so for all of you who have never been here or are wondering what New York, New York Marcus is, um, it's just like, and I'm just going to tell you a quick story about me too. Um, like I didn't go to school, like I got a GED, right? And, I don't, and it took me until I was like 20, 26 to say that publicly and be okay with it. And I actually, and now I, I weaponize it in spaces, especially white spaces. Um, my, my grandfather is, um, he was in World War II and I came back from the GI Bill and had, of course, when I mean, he came back and G.I. Bill had, he could get no help. He was on a promise that he was gonna be able to get some, some benefits from the government and everything. And then he, um, he let us know, like, nothing be fulfilled but a try. And always be in spaces that has people wondering, like, what it is you think you're doing, right? So challenging those sort of like, assumptions that you're gonna be able to win, but also um, addressing it blatantly and upfront and unapologetically. And that's what Nubian Marcus is. I mean, we, we are in the middle of a community that has, has um, that's changing. Um, and we wanted to make sure Nubian Market could exist for us um, and center the realities of the people that are habitually exclu excluded from these types of opportunities. 
and demand the type of investment that has always avoided us over the years. And so um, during the pandemic, um, I moved back to Cleveland not knowing that this, this deal was gonna happen. I live right next door to my parents in Cleveland, have an apartment in Dorchester, because I didn't know what was gonna happen. And so even amongst all of this craziness, we were still able to make this thing happen. We have over 35 um, black owned products on the shelf here. Um, we're working with the black farmer ecosystem between New York State, um, Maine, uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, black growers that we're working with over the summer that you'll be seeing in the center over there, uh, just to make sure that we own the spaces to be able to make the opportunity for other folks in the food system that you know are excluded from these sort of large scale investments. So that's what this is. I welcome everybody to hear. We, we, we've centered the food around our collective diaspora. Um, I'm African American, my partner's from Eritrea. Uh, so what you have is this sort of connection between me wondering when can I ever get to the continent, to him saying, dang, I had to leave the continent because he was in a war-torn country. He had to change his birthday to get away. And so there's all these different realities that that we went through, and so it's just, um, and you'll see on our logo, there's a small little island to the, to the, to the left of, of, of Africa that doesn't really exist. And I call it the, 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 the sort of fictitious island of, of the diaspora. So it's like those folks who are from, you know, North America that, that never went back and are longing to get back. Folks from, my brother from Brazil, folks from the islands that are just like, we're all in its collective space. So it's just a celebration of us all, and this is what Nubian Markets is. If you all know any entrepreneurs that's looking for space, we, we cut out the middlemen, nobody's eating off of anything except for like real margins. Because these are all the ways that, that, that exclude us from really making it. So looking for black entrepreneurs, looking for black growers in the Northeast, um, and then um, you know just let us know what we can do better. So that's what Nubian Markets is, welcome to the space. It's really nice to be able to have this in our space, especially on today, it means a lot. And so. Thank you. My name is Ryan Samad. And uh, that's, that's my. Thank you for that. Yeah. 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 Tell us what we're going to be eating today. Do you know I have no idea. Ah, I yeah. was just, like I said, I was in the back, everything else. But my man Alonzo. Sure. Chicken. Like, yeah, yeah. Alonzo throws it down. He's the chef here. Um, he, like you like he said, he is he's amazing. And I, I trust whatever he made is going to be something that's good. And. Feel free to walk the store afterwards too. Alright, let's go quickly.